Okay. Well, um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Oliver. Um, I am the host of today's CSUA Simple session. Uh, I'm very happy that you are joining us from all across Europe. As you might know, uh, yesterday Zurich was uh, celebrating its uh, spring festivity called Sechsileuten. Um, and, and so I think ZKW is a uh, the main sponsor of this event. So uh, it was maybe a, a tough day for us all, but we are very happy to be here at 11 o'clock and uh, to, to hear from Mjartin Veder about the global economic and financial outlook uh, uh, that ZKB is, is seeing in, in, in Europe uh, and Switzerland. Um, and I have to mention this for the first time. So the ones who are familiar with the custom, we always burn a snowman uh, to see whether it will be a good summer or a bad summer. So they take the time when they start the fire until the head explodes. And uh, for the first time in over 100 years, they were not able to actually start the fire because it had too much wind. So we don't know how the summer will be, but we will know how the economy will be. So uh, after this speech of Mr. Veda, I will make a brief intro and uh, again, I'm also welcoming you. Uh, this is a, a joint project of the Chamber of Commerce Switzerland Central Europe here in Zurich, uh, where we are representing the 17 countries of Central Eastern Europe in Switzerland. But we do this project and we also collaborate with our brother and sister Chambers of Commerce across Central Eastern Europe. You can see them here. And uh, again, as usual, uh, uh, it's very important uh, that we actively, positively influence the relationship between Switzerland and Central Eastern Europe. And uh, uh, one little element is this impulse sessions that brings us together once a month about <clears throat> inspiring topics uh, between uh, the life of Switzerland and Central Eastern Europe. So thank you to all the other chambers of commerce who are co-organizing. Uh, as usual, uh, we will have about a 25 to 30 minute speech. You will, uh, of course, be allowed to ask questions for uh, the question part. Please uh, push the button uh, at the bottom. There's a Q&A button and uh, we will uh, then answer your questions. You will be on mute. Uh, we will also not see you, unfortunately. We will, as usual, and on time, which is a quarter to 12, uh, with the option, if there's many questions, to, to stay on. Um, if you have anything uh, interesting to say, use the chat functions. Uh, you can also tell everybody where you're from um, and from what city and say good morning to everybody. And uh, But also if you have an, an insight uh, about the topic, uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat functions. Um, and you will at the end receive the slides and uh, the contact details uh, of all chambers of commerce. And you will also get the contact details of Martin, and you can rewatch the session on our YouTube channel with all the other sessions that we have uh, pre-recorded. Um, yeah, um, before we uh, uh, go and at the start, I also would like to uh, give a brief outlook to the next session, which will be uh, most probably on already the 7th of May about artificial intelligence, the key topic at the moment, uh, in a very particular field in medtech. So uh, this will be our next CSW simple session. Uh, more information will follow soon. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Weder. He's uh, the chief economist and head of uh, the economic uh, department. I just had to check something here economic research at ZKB. His team is responsible for the analysis and forecast of macroeconomic, monetary policy, and geopolitical developments. Before joining ZKB in 2018, as senior economist for Europe, so he's a specialist for our region, he worked at the Swiss National Bank in the Financial Market Analysis Unit and as a research associate for Economy Swiss, the Federation of Swiss Businesses, and uh, a good partner also of our organization. He holds a PhD in political economy from the University of Lucerne and an MA in economics from the University of St. Gallen and Sofia. So Martin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Oliver, for this uh, kind introduction, and thank you for having me on this monthly uh, impulse session. Uh, I hope you can hear me, and I hope you can also see the slides. So uh, as Oliver Berchinger already mentioned, I will start with a brief economic and financial outlook, uh, how we see the world currently, and also with a focus on, of course, on Central and Eastern Europe. And after this outlook, I will continue with some structural issues uh, that are still uh, many countries is dealing with, such as demographics, the energy transition, of course, uh, geopolitics uh, with all kinds of conflicts going on uh, around the world right now. And then we'll also end on a more positive note how these uh, challenging times actually present some very interesting uh, opportunities for, for investment and maybe also uh, for you, depending on what country and business uh, you're active in. So let's start uh, with the economic and financial outlook. Um, actually, the world economic is still holding up much better than most people thought just, just a year ago. Uh, a year ago, it was a huge consensus among economists that the US especially, but also Europe, would fall into a recession. Uh, that hasn't materialized so far. Uh, actually, the US economy grew by 2.5% last year, so much, much better uh, than expected. Europe, on the other hand, is more or less uh, stagnating, has been stagnating for, for quite a while. But so far, no recession either, especially the labor market is still doing uh, extremely well. So this is actually a lot of good news. Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, many challenges remain. Why is the uh, economy uh, not doing very well right now? Well, of course, we've had this huge inflation shock. And as a response to that, central banks were hiking interest rates quite rapidly. We have had the most pronounced rate hikes since the 1980s. So that's the, the main reason why many economists were expecting recession, because this is usually the pattern that we observe, uh, a spike in inflation followed by a spike in interest rates. And those interest rates tend to dampen growth and inflation quite substantially. But this time is different, at least so far, it seems. Uh, but also growth is, is quite low. As you can see on, on this chart, uh, the world economy is growing below its long-term potential. It will grow below potential this year and also next year uh, with some, some notable exception. I mentioned the US, uh, but also most emerging markets are still growing quite rapidly. Uh, so it's not too bad, but not too great either. Not too exciting times. But when we come to the outlook looking forward, you can see our growth projection for this year and next, uh, with the exception of the US, perhaps, uh, where we expect growth to decline from a high level. Most economy actually seem to be turning the corner right now. And so we expect some acceleration as, as the year goes on. And then especially 2025 uh, will be better than both 2024 and 2023. Why do we think so? Um, we see an increase in leading indicators, which you can see on this chart on the left-hand side. Most notably, the Global Purchasing Manager Index has been rising for quite a few months. Uh, several other leading and sentiment indicators are on the rise as well. So actually, things seem to brighten up. Um, and also, as you can see on the right-hand side, economic data continue to surprise. On the positive side, this is a look at the global level but it also holds true for most countries and regions as well. So despite all those geopolitical events, inflation shock, rising interest rates, um, consumers and businesses that are under a lot of uh, financial pressure, still the economy seems to be doing better uh, than most people thought. What's the reason for that? I think there may be two key, key points here to make. One is a fiscal policy. Uh, which is still uh, quite expansionary, especially in the US, but also uh, in Europe with the Next Generation EU Recovery Fund and uh, generous subsidies for the for energy, especially uh, after the price spike in 2022. So most households and, and firms have been shielded quite well uh, from, from those two shocks, also from the, from the pandemic. And also businesses and households were able to build up uh, financial puffers during the pandemic, but, but also in the years after, after the pandemic. So those two factors were able to cushion some of the, of the blow that we, that we received from, from monetary policy. Um, so actually, there was a, a good and, and lucky coincidence that the shock from monetary policy was be able to offset 
with a generous fiscal policy measures and also with some financial buffers that households and businesses were able uh, to resort to. Coming now to Central and Eastern Europe, the picture here is, is quite similar. I have shown here on this chart economic sentiment. This is a monthly indicator from the European Commission. And you should see a similar picture here in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, most of them are, are open economies, uh, highly integrated into the, the global economy, especially integrated to Western Europe uh, economies. And we see that a slow recovery is actually underway, has been underway for, for quite a while. Uh, in terms of economic sentiment, the trough was, was already reached in late 2022. And since then, we've seen a very slow but steady uh, recovery. Uh, this sentiment indicator, the long-term average is, is calculated to be 100, so, so we're still below the, the long-term average. And you also see quite a lot of dispersion within Central and, and Eastern Europe. So I've highlighted here uh, the, the lowest sentiment indicator right now is Estonia, which is uh, still in a recession. And on the other hand, we've had, we have Bulgaria at the top with sentiment uh, above its long-term average. So it's quite a lot of divergence within Central and, and Eastern Europe, but, but, but the general trend is upwards. Uh, you see also see how this sentiment indicator is calculated. It's mostly indicators from the manufacturing sector because this tends to be the most cyclical part of the economy, but also services uh, with a weight of 30%, consumer sentiment, but also retail and construction. So this gets a fairly accurate view of how firms and households currently see the situation and what their expectations are uh, going forward. And historically, this indicator has correlated very highly with, with actual GDP growth. And this is also the aim of, of this indicator to give a uh, timely view of, of the economy and also timely view of, of the short-term outlook. So even for, for Central and Eastern Europe, which is perhaps even more affected by, by inflation, uh, by the war in the Ukraine, even here we see an uptick in, in sentiment. So we think the worst is, is behind those economies uh, as well. And we're looking for ongoing recovery this year and then especially in 2025. Uh, you see this here summarized with, with growth projections. Uh, as I mentioned, Estonia in recession, we've seen some other uh, countries like Lithuania, Hungary, and, and the Czech Republic, where the economy contracted slightly in, in 2023 as well. But now the consensus is for all those uh, countries to accelerate and to have quite solid growth rates this year and then also next year. Turning now to inflation, this is still a, a major challenge for, for many countries uh, and economies. We see that in general, the downward trend continues, uh, but annual rates remain above the central bank targets in most cases. We also see that in the US, uh, inflation has picked up again in, in recent months and thereby postponing uh, central bank rate cuts that financial market participants uh, have been expecting for quite a while, but don't, haven't materialized just yet. You also see that Switzerland, once again, is, is quite an exception. Uh, inflation is back to 1%. So, so once again, among the lowest uh, all around the world. And you also see that the spike in inflation was much less pronounced in 2022. Uh, the peak was reached at 3.5%, uh, a rate many countries would pay millions for, I'm sure, if they could have that just, just right now. So Switzerland seems to be privileged once again, many factors responsible for that, uh, certainly in monetary policy with the Swiss National Bank uh, known as a hawkish central bank, uh, as a central bank who takes its mandate for price stability quite seriously. And then also this was helped by the Swiss franc uh, tending to appreciate over time. It's always searched for as a safe haven. So this has helped as well. And then, of course, we were also lucky because of the energy mix in Switzerland, uh, especially gas plays a much smaller role, both for, for heating, but also in, in manufacturing than in many other uh, countries. And so that was another reason why energy prices and along uh, inflation didn't rise as much as in, as in other countries. You also see that Central and Eastern Europe, in some countries, inflation was rising much more pronounced uh, than elsewhere. We've seen double-digit rates, even rates above 20% in countries uh, such as Hungary. But 
uh, a spike was much more pronounced. Now also the decline is more pronounced uh, than in the West. So we're once again at levels that are more or less uh, acceptable, maybe with the exception of Romania, where we're still at around 7%. But the downward trend here seems to continue as well. So overall, the picture is much more benign than, say, a year and especially two years ago. But uh, as I mentioned with the US, we're now going for the hardest part in terms of uh, fighting inflation. The easy part is, is already behind us. What do I mean by that? Um, as you can see in this chart for, for advanced economies, the spike was primarily driven by energy and food prices, uh, but also supply bottlenecks that affected uh, goods prices uh, around the world. So these were basically the two large shocks that I mentioned, first the pandemic and then the Ukraine war in, in 2022. Those two shocks uh, are starting uh, to abate and we see energy and food prices are normalizing again, whether it's gas and electricity prices in Europe, but also food prices more, more generally at, at stores. Uh, supply bottlenecks in manufacturing sectors have mostly disappeared, not completely, but they have dissipated quite substantially. And now we're coming to the hardest part and the hardest part is the services sector, which is now responsible for about 80% of inflation. If you look at the years 2019 and 2020, this is actually uh, how it used to be, that services is, is the main driver of inflation. But it's also the stickiest part of, of inflation. And that is because wages are still rising strongly in most countries. This is the most important co cost factor for, for services. And we still have a lot of price pressure in shelter, um, real estate prices, rents, are an important driver, especially in North America, but also many European countries. And then we have sectors such as healthcare, leisure and hospitality, transport and travel, where price pressures after the pandemic are still elevated. So it will take time to get inflation all the way down to 2% or wherever the inflation target is. In some countries in Central and East Europe, it's 2.5% or 3% or, or even more. Uh, but even at those slightly higher targets, we're, we're still not quite there. But the trend is, is heading in the right direction. And so uh, inflation will fall further, even in, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. These are once again the, the annual forecasts uh, for this year and next. And you see that 2023 was still very elevated, but with a general downward trade through the course of the year. And now this year and next, at least is this, this is the Bloomberg uh, consensus from March. Um, economists and analysts expect inflation to be much more moderate again. Uh, let's say around average levels that uh, were observed prior to, to the pandemic in, in most countries. And so with inflation all, almost back to target, this calls for uh, interest rate uh, normalization. So turning to monetary policy, uh, as I mentioned, we're still waiting for the first rate cuts from, from the US Fed and also from the European central banks. On the other hand, we've already seen the Swiss National Bank cut rates in, in March uh, to the surprise of, of many observers. But advanced economies are now following in the path that uh, most uh, emerging and developing economies have already taken in late uh, 2023, and that is uh, lowering key policy interest rates. You see, for example, Hungary, rates have already come quite substantially, uh, and others such as Poland and, and Czech Republic have, have followed uh, recently. So the picture is quite similar in for, for Central and Eastern Europe here as, as well. They're actually leading the charge compared to, to Western economies. Uh, they were quicker to, to react to the inflation shock. Um, most Western central banks were actually lagging. They were too late uh, to react. Uh, but this now, on the other hand, allows those uh, emerging uh, economy central banks to cut rates earlier and, and, and quicker than, than in the West. So turning now, what does this mean for financial markets? Usually uh, when growth is accelerating, inflation is declining, uh, key policy rates are falling, central banks and maybe especially financial market participants, economists tend to talk about Goldilocks. So this is more or less the perfect combination growth improving, inflation declining, lower interest rates. And we've already observed this to a large extent in, in equity markets. They have been rising for quite a while since late fall, especially in advanced economies. 
and up until the the end of March. Maybe April now is a bit different because of uh, the geopolitical situation, especially now with the, the attack of of our Iran on on Israel uh, during the weekend. But also because good news now tends to be bad news again, especially now with the the US where growth is holding up, the labor market is holding up, uh, and inflation is much higher than than expected. So. Rate cuts are postponed. Uh, interest rates are likely to remain elevated, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, with 10-year government bonds uh, still elevated and also highly volatile. And this is now increasingly uh, having a negative effect on, on equity markets as well. So it used to be Goldilocks up until the end of March. Maybe the next few months will be a bit more challenging, also because probably equity markets got a bit ahead of themselves over the last, say, six or seven months. Uh, as I mentioned, things are improving, but maybe not as quickly uh, and as clearly as, as equity markets are currently uh, implying. So maybe there will be a, a, a setback or two uh, on equity markets before we can see those that recovery continue uh, again. So this basically sums up the, my short uh, economic and financial outlook. This is the cyclical view uh, of the TKB of our bank. But as I mentioned, along with those cyclical challenges, we have many structural issues. And I will start with, with demographics. Uh, what's the issue here? Um, well, it's obvious we have a shortage of, of skilled workers uh, all around the world, basically. It's a huge deal in the US and, and in the Eurozone, but of course, perhaps even more so in, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. And you can see here the, the monthly indicator once again from, uh, or the quarterly indicator from the European Commission, where firms all around Europe are asked, what is the primary factor that is holding back or limiting production? This is done for both the manufacturing, the services and the construction sector. And you can see that over time, the share of firms that cite labor as the primary factor limiting production tends to rise. <clears throat> this is basically interrupted by short-term fluctuations, such as the financial crisis in 20, uh, 2008, 2009, and then, of course, also um, during the pandemic. But the overall trend, the structural trend, is upwards, and this is precisely because of uh, demographic changes. Firms can name uh, different factors for, for limited production, such as financial constraints, um, deficient demand, uh, other materials, supply bottlenecks, or non-factors non at all. And you see here that over 30% of firms tend to name labor as the primary factor limiting production. This is across all sectors. It has been declining in manufacturing now for for cyclical reasons, uh, management manufacturing sector has been in recession for a while. Uh, but here again, the structural trend is also clearly upward. So this is an issue uh, that will remain for us, labor uh, scarcity in general, because more people in Europe are retiring than people entering the, the labor market, despite uh, high immigration in, in some countries. And this, this trend will continue in the next few years. And you can also see it in the unemployment rates, Despite those economic challenges over the past two or three years, uh, the unemployment rate has continued to decline and is actually at an all-time low right now, both in the European Union and also in the Eurozone. This is quite quite remarkable. Here also, most economists expect an uptick uh, in, in unemployment rates, even only slightly, but we actually haven't seen anything like that at all, at least on on aggregate. In some countries, you've seen a, some increase, but overall unemployment has remained very, very low. And uh, looking forward uh, here with the projections for, for demographics, uh, how will the working age population, so this is people aged 15 to 64, change from today to 2050? And not surprisingly, uh, this downward trend that, that I mentioned uh, that has already started like a decade ago in, in the case of Japan, even more than, than 20 years ago, this trend uh, will continue. Uh, we've taken this number here from, from Oxford Economics, uh, who are known for, for good and reliable long-term projections, but you can also take the projections from the UN that show a quite, quite similar picture. Uh, and you also see that the US and Switzerland, along with India, are at a notable exception. The working age population is still expected to rise 
uh, until 2050. Which is which is quite remarkable because the general trend, as I mentioned, is is in the other direction. Also, in in many emerging and developing countries, even Brazil, that is shown here uh, in this chart. Uh, but I would also like to stress: okay, this is a general trend, and perhaps Central and Eastern Europe is more negatively affected than than Western economies. But it's also less pronounced than, say, in in many East Asian countries such as Japan, South Korea, uh, or even China. So this is a is a big challenge, but it's not something that only Central and Eastern Europe is dealing with. It basically affects most uh, economies uh, around the world and some countries even more so uh, than Central and Eastern Europe. So not everything is, is hopeless. Uh, it's a challenge, but a challenge that can be addressed, especially through uh, education uh, and innovation that I personally think will, will become even more important um, looking forward. So along with that labor market uh, or labor scarcity, not surprisingly for, for economists, if labor is scarce, wages will rise. And this is exactly what we observe. And even more so in, in Central and Eastern Europe, where wages are still rising at double digit rates in, in many cases. So this is a burden for, for firms. Yes, that's true. Uh, costs are rising rapidly. But it also has to do, as I mentioned, with labor scarcity on one hand and higher inflation um, on the other hand. And more generally, if, if you basically exclude the last two or three years, this is actually what you want as a, as a government, but also as, as a business for households and employees to, for their wages to rise because then consumption will rise and with consumption, uh, economic development and prosperity uh, will continue. But of course, now at this current level, this is, this is much too high. This is a concern uh, both for central banks and also for, for firms. But here, as, as inflation is, is moderating, also wage growth uh, will likely moderate, continue to moderate uh, in the next few years. You see that on aggregate in the EU, wages are currently rising only at, at around 4%. That's, so that's not a whole lot. And actually, wages were not able to keep up uh, with inflation. So real wages, that is wages after inflation uh, are, were actually lower than they were uh, pre-pandemic. So there's some catching up uh, effects here taking place as well. And you see that the more larger uh, economies in, in Western Europe, France, Germany, and Italy, uh, wages are growing at a, at a much, much lower rate. But this is actually the, the Kuro normal. So this is what we observed pre-pandemic as well, but of course at, at different uh, wage growth uh, rates than we currently observe. So this is one challenge, maybe perhaps even a uh, bigger challenge, at least in the, in the short term, is of course uh, geopolitics and more generally the, the fracturing of the, the world economy into two blocks, the US allied blocks and the China, Russia uh, allied blocks. What's what's the issue there and what's, what's our take uh, on this? Um, starting with deglobalization to, to use a more general term, uh, so far, maybe more a myth than, than reality, but the general trend here is, is in the wrong direction. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have a lot of, have had a lot of harmful trade interventions since the global financial crisis. Um, you see in blue, harmful trade interventions, and in, in light blue, liberalizing interventions, and the ratio is about six to one, so a lot more harmful interventions. What do we mean by, by harmful interventions? We mean, for example, trade uh, barriers, increasing tariffs, um, general restrictions to trade, um, subsidies, both for exports and, and for the domestic economy. Uh, that is the distorting uh, competition. Uh, maybe you've heard that the US finance minister, Janet Yellen, just visited China recently and once again said that it's unacceptable how China is dumping uh, cheap goods and energy on, on the rest of the world. Uh, Europe has, has, is doing the same thing. Uh, but of course, the US and, and, and the Europe, they're no angels as well. They're no saints. They're doing similar things, maybe to a lesser extent than, than China. Uh, but we've seen more and more of these kind of trade restrictions. And you can see on the right-hand side, increasingly, they're starting to have an impact on the real economy and, of course, also on, on prices. You see that and at the beginning of this millennium, we've had the phase of hyper-globalization where global trade was growing much more rapidly than production. We have had China joining the 
WTO in 2001 and trade around the world really growing rapidly, much more rapidly than production. This was interrupted by the global financial crisis. And then we've had around a decade that the Economist the magazine labeled globalization. So trade and production were growing at more or less the same rate, also at a lower rate uh, than just before the global financial crisis. Then we've had the pandemic and now the last couple of years we've had trade and both industrial production shrinking. So maybe here I put here a question mark. This is open whether this trend will continue, but some indication uh, maybe that we are entering a phase of, of deglobalization where actually trade is shrinking or growing less rapidly uh, than production. So firms, entire countries shifting back production to their uh, domestic economy or trade folk, uh, increasingly centered on, on partners that are close, that are allies, uh, and less on um, yeah on countries that they were relied on previously, such as China and, and Russia. So I said the global economy is increasingly fracturing in those two, two blocks. Um, you see here US allies and countries that tend to lean to the US on the left-hand side, and we have countries that are China allies or leaning towards China. And I only put here the Central and Eastern Europe uh, countries and, and economies. And this is an analysis, analysis done by Capital Economics, uh, independent research provider that we rely on. We're doing excellent independent research. How did they come up with this uh, attribution of, of countries? Well, first of all, they looked at what's the public perception uh, in the respective countries. They looked at surveys. Um, is the general population more favorable towards the US or towards China? Uh, or is the res uh, respective country bar part of the Belt and Road Initiative? How does the country vote in the US General Assembly? Is there a military presence of US or China uh, army forces in, in the respective country? What are our security alliance and so forth? So there's a whole list of, of indicators and, and data. And then they uh, came up with this uh, attribution. And you see that most countries in Central and Eastern Europe are in the US allies block or at least tend to lean uh, towards that block. There's no one in the unaligned block, which I think is, is interesting. Uh, globally, we have, for example, Brazil, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, also Saudi Arabia uh, that are in the unaligned block. But the most Central and Eastern Europe are clearly in the US block. Some uh, are leaning towards China. And a few are clearly in the China and allies blocks, such as Russia, Belarus, Tajikistan, and, and Kyrgyzstan. So those two clear blocks, uh, deep division uh, be between the two. Um, so you can say, well, what's what's the problem here? Uh, maybe it's another Cold War like we've had before between the US and the Soviet Union. So this time it's the US and China-Russia block. But as long as it's a Cold War and not actual military conflict, what's the problem there? Well, the problem could be uh, that not so, so no much from a military perspective, but much more from an economic and, and everyday uh, perspective. For example, if you look at the right-hand chart, this is a list from the European Commission where they looked at the most uh, critical products uh, that the EU depends on. It's a list of 137 products from many different areas such as semiconductors, batteries, uh, energy in general, raw materials, rare earths, hydrogen, uh, cloud computing, edge computing, and so forth, pharmaceutical ingredients also. And we look at that list from, from the use perspective, you see that over half of, of those critical products are actually produced in China. So there's a huge uh, dependence on, on China in many, many areas of, of daily life and daily economic uh, activity. Uh, Russia, some, some part as well, especially uh, in the energy sector. So it's just not realistic or at least not at reasonable uh, economic costs to completely decouple from that China and allies block. And this is exactly what the EU is doing. We're talking about de-risking instead of decoupling. So of course, we still want to have trade uh, with China and China allied uh, countries, but we're trying to reduce the risk. And this risk, as I said, in some, some areas is, is quite substantial. We're trying to reduce um, that risk. And actually China is doing exactly the, the, the same thing. They're trying to cut dependence 
uh, from the rest of the world and try to produce much more uh, locally. On the left hand side, you see how those two blocks, when you look at the whole world, uh, are aligned in, in terms of population. The two blocks are actually of, of similar size uh, in terms of countries. The, the US blocks US block is larger. And when you look at economic power, this is just a, a economic capacity or, or gross domestic product. The US allied blocks is actually um, much larger uh, than the China allied block. But nonetheless, uh, it's a pretty much evenly divided uh, world, it seems. And you also see that the unaligned block as I mentioned, there's no one in, in Europe who, who is part in the underlying block, and globally, it's really only a handful uh, of countries that are co considered uh, unaligned. So the, the world is basically already divided in those two, two blocks. And as I said, this is an issue, especially also when we talk about the uh, energy transition, which by itself is a big challenge, but perhaps even more so when a lot of it depends on materials and supplies from, from China. How is Europe currently doing uh, with, with that respect? You see here the energy transition index score provided by the, by the World Economic Forum. This is an annual uh, study that they do. And to my surprise, at least, I think uh, Central and Eastern Europe is doing surprisingly well. You see uh, Estonia is even in the top 10. The list is, is headed by the Nordics, followed by many other uh, advanced economies. But then shortly after that, you actually see many Central and Eastern European uh, economies. And if you look at it globally, um, emerging Europe is actually the second best uh, or the second best well-equipped uh, country block to, to deal with this energy transition. What do we mean by that? It, we're talking about balancing energy security on one side, but also uh, equity and economic considerations and sustainability at the same time. So we're trying to balance those three goals uh, at the same time. And Emerging Europe is, is doing better than I actually thought. And perhaps more importantly, which you, which you don't see on this table, is the transition or the trend over time. And here actually we've seen a lot more progress uh, in Central and Eastern Europe at least according to this to the study by the World Economic Forum, than in many other uh, countries and re regions. So it's the advanced economies first, but then followed by emerging Europe, uh, actually ahead of Asia, Latin America, and all other regions. So I think this is quite, quite encouraging. Uh, although, of course, still many challenges here remain as well. Um, we have some countries where uh, electric electricity production is still heavily CO2 emission uh, intensive, heavily reliant on coal, for example. But, but as I said, what, what matters here is not, much, not so much the situation, but uh, the potential and, and the trend. And here I'm quite optimistic for, for Central and Eastern European economies. So another challenge related to that is defense, uh, not only because of the, the war in Ukraine, but, but this is obviously the, the most important issue currently uh, for Europe. Uh, with NATO targets and contribution, a heavily politicized topic. Um, but actually, we've seen some encouraging news here recently as well. Uh, these are last year's numbers, and you see some Western Eastern divide here as well. Uh, I would say that most Central and Eastern Europe countries have done their homework. They've done their homework for quite a while. While many Western Europe economies are trailing, they're falling behind, they have been falling behind for quite a while and even before the Ukraine war, you surely remember President, with former US President Trump um, complaining that Europe is not doing its job, it's not contributing enough to, to security. It's basically free riding, relying too much uh, uh, on the US in terms of security issues. And you can say about Donald Trump what, what you want, but I think he, he had a good point there. Um, but I think slowly but steadily, uh, Western Europe economies are also waking up uh, to this new uh, reality and starting to, to increase their military expenditure and, and their NATO uh, contributions. And you see it on, on this chart here. This is actually from, from NATO, just a few released a few weeks ago, where you can see that for the first time, NATO Europe, so this is just European countries, are actually reaching or are expected to reach that 2% target um, this year. So we've seen a quite pronounced increase in 2023 and uh, even more so um, this year. So finally, NATO Europe is on course. But then, of course, the question is, is that money allocated uh, efficiently? Because we have some 
countries in, in Western Europe that are increasing uh, military expenditure. But right now, the biggest block is just personal uh, expenditure. So they're still lacking equipment, uh, lacking infrastructure. And so even, even though they might reach a 2% target, they're still quite far away from, from where they should be or where they want to be. Uh, but you also see in this chart, it takes uh, years, if not, not decades, to build up that that military capacity uh, now with this ongoing threat uh, from from Russia, but at least the trend here is is going the right uh, direction as well. So, lots of challenges. Uh, but I'd, as I mentioned, I'd like to end on a more optimistic note with opportunities uh, for for investment, and and I'll start with the next generation EU fund that I. Uh, already mentioned at the beginning. So this is 800 billion euros of, of public investment, really a unique, unique uh, opportunity for Europe. Um, many areas that are addressed, such as digital uh, transformation, uh, green energy, research and development, education. So many, many areas and, and a lot of money. And you can always argue maybe some of that money will be wasted and not allocated efficiently. We've seen some stories from some countries, uh, for example, Italy, where it seems that uh, the government doesn't really know where to put that money. They're just, uh, it's just too much money to, to allocate efficiently uh, at the same time. So this might be an issue for, for some countries, uh, but I would see it more as, as an opportunity and especially for, for Central and Eastern Europe, because you can see they tend to benefit more uh, than, than Western Europe economies. Uh, based on the criteria that were set. And I think this makes makes perfect sense um, to further uh, uh, in, uh, enable economic uh, convergence between Western, Central and, and Eastern Europe. So in some cases, these are vast amounts of, of money. Uh, in some cases, more than 10% of, of annual GDP allocated within a few, few years. Uh, so definitely a challenge here as well, but I'd see this as a great, great, and maybe once in a generation or even once in a lifetime, uh, opportunity for Europe here to to really move move forward and and address the many challenges uh, that we currently face. And so, of course, for for business, the question is always how to invest going forward in in a increasingly divided, uh, polarized world. Uh, business questioning whether we should still invest in China. So, what's the alternative to China if you think China is unreliable, uh, no longer as attractive as it used to be. And a question that we often receive from, from clients is, is India maybe the next China? So you see here a, a slide or a picture from a from a publication we did about two years ago uh, where we addressed this question. And, and the simple answer is no, China, uh, India is not the next China. Um, in terms of population, it's, it's may already larger, but in terms of size of the economy and economic uh, attractiveness, competitiveness, it's still far, far uh, behind China. And you see in the chart, GDP per capita is still much, much lower uh, than in China and much, much lower than in, in Central and Eastern Europe. You see, for example, Czech Republic, Poland, and, and Hungary that have seen a huge economic progress in the last three uh, decades. And India is nowhere near uh, that economic capacity or, or prosperity than those three countries are. Uh, you see at the bottom some key, key obstacles. Uh, that we addressed that we see in India from excessive bureaucracy to lack of industrial know-how. Uh, yeah, many other issues such as inadequate infrastructure. And I think with all reg with regards to those five factors, basically all Central and Eastern Europe would uh, rank uh, much better or much, much higher. So India definitely has a lot of love potential, but I think the same is true for, for many Central and, and Eastern uh, economies. And so finally, let's come to financial investment. This is basically the real investment part. I will now uh, come to portfolio investment and how can investors uh, participate um, looking forward in, in emerging markets. And this is actually how Zekabe, how we currently invest for, for our clients. And maybe this is surprising to, to most of you, at least it was su still surprising to me after, after all these years, is that emerging markets actually make up only a small share both in equity and in, in bond investments. You see on the left-hand side in equities, it's currently only 8% and it's all in US dollar denominated, so no local currencies. And the same is true for bonds, 
shares a little higher there at, at 11%, but this is still very small because it's the whole emerging market universe. So this is more than 20 countries. And of course, including large economies such as China, India, Korea. And if you would guess how large the share of, of Central and Eastern Europe is, I actually looked this up because uh, I was curious to find out. It's even, it's of course, it's even much, much smaller. Within those 8% of, of equity investments, it, only 1% is, is Central and Eastern Europe. And within bond investments of those 11%, it's around 9% is Central and Eastern Europe. So overall around 1% of bond investments is emerging Europe and 0.1% in, in equity investments. And you can clearly see this is, these are really tiny numbers. And in my opinion, probably two small numbers, at least looking forward with the economic potential that those countries have and the growth, the economic growth that they have year after year, I think those numbers will increase. And knowing that, uh, investors might already anticipate that uh, development and start investing now in order to, to participate as, as early as possible, uh, because that share is, is only going up uh, from here it's so small it cannot possibly decline more and maybe at some some day we will also invest in in local currency and i think many other banks investors uh, will do the same thing so i think also from a portfolio investor perspective uh, those countries uh, have a lot of potential as well so i think i've taken a bit too long i will uh, summarize briefly what i was trying to to get across uh, I think overall Central and Eastern Europe economies are well equipped to navigate not only the cyclical, but also the many structural challenges uh, that are, are ahead of us. Um, demographics, certainly a, a big issue also for, for Central and Eastern Europe, but I think in terms of geopolitics, energy transition, I was actually surprised. I think they, those countries did a lot better than I expected them to do. I think there's a lot of reason to be cautiously uh, optimistic, but also from a perspective, I think these countries are still attractive, both for real uh, and financial investment. And I'm not saying this, be this because I was invited to, to have a talk here at the Impulse Session. This is really my, my personal conviction uh, and also my my advice to, to our clients, but, but maybe also to you. Uh, I think, yeah, the CEE countries are still a good place to invest, even after all those challenges and conflicts that we currently observe. So with that, I think I'll conclude and I'll be more than happy to take your comments and questions. Thank you. Martin, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Oh, super. I was talking all the time. Sorry, sorry. Uh, and nobody heard me, so I don't know what's happening. Anyway, I was just asking a question about nearshoring. Would you say that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this trend of nearshoring will continue or not? Uh, that, you know, you talked about this deglobalization, you talked about these blocks, and uh, and uh, do you see, in, in this case, uh, like a closer collaboration now uh, in, in real economic uh, and business uh, uh, transaction between now Switzerland and Central Eastern Europe. How do you see that? Yes, Judge. The short answer is yes. I see this uh, <laughs> trend to continue. Whether you call it nearshoring or maybe French shoring, this is also another term. So you shift production to to countries that are having good good relationships. But I would also say, as an economist, so far this is more talk than than action. So a lot of people and firms make those considerations. They talk about it. Uh, 
Um, but it's one thing to to talk about it and, and another thing to to actually do it. And we've seen some some evidence, yes, that this is occurring, but not really on a on a large scale. And I also think this will take time. And and it's costly. I mean, generally, if you're a Central Eastern Europe firm, or even if you're based in Switzerland, yeah, sure, you, you can talk about shifting uh, production from China back to to your home country, but you don't do it do it overnight. And those countries are much more expensive to produce. So there will always be those economic considerations, security considerations, supply chain considerations. So it's not an easy, easy decision. And I don't think it's straightforward for those countries to just move move back. It's just, I mentioned labor scarcity, uh, general wages, wages are higher. So it's not a, a foregone conclusion that it makes perfect sense to to shift everything back back home. It's not it's not that simple. But generally, yes, I think this uh, over time more and more firms and, and countries will, will tend in that direction, especially as long as geopolitical conflicts and this uh, adversity between the US and China will, will continue. Okay, so uh, uh, my friends from uh, Serbia and Romania had two comments and uh, I, you know, I've been uh, with, with economic numbers, it's always difficult, you know, sometimes you get a, a chart that has uh, potentially a, a, a little different, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say saying or 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 meaning then uh, uh, so I had to get from Romania they were saying that Romania has now a better cheap DP capital than Hungary so that's from Claudio so we noticed that and also Anna I think that's important Anna Kontic is uh, responsible for for economy in Switzerland for for Serbia the Serbian uh, deep, uh, general consulate she 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 wanted to stress uh, uh, that Serbia is not leaning towards China. <laughs> and uh, and and China, Serbia's uh, main economic partner is the EU, uh, and that they signed an FTA with China, which contributes to the opening of the market for many Serbian products, but also for many companies from the EU. And uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, let's let's say that. That's uh, thank you, Anna, for this. And then there was a question about what about investments in Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and, and Montenegro? How do you see investments in general uh, in those uh, three countries, Martin? Uh, that's perhaps a bit more difficult uh, for those countries. Uh, when we talk about in terms of, of block building or in terms of integration with, with Western economies, um, I think it's difficult for countries that are not part of the EU. Uh, if you talk about block building, you have to there's increasing pressure to be part of a bloc. I mean, this is also an issue for, for Switzerland, who is not an EU member country. Um, those countries that you mentioned are not EU member countries either. So there's always that open question that, that will remain. Is it possible that they will join the EU? Or should they join the EU? As we talk in, in uh, as we talk about that issue in Switzerland as well, constantly. I don't think it's necessary uh, for those countries to, to flourish or to be attractive uh, for investment. Uh, when we talk about catch-up potential, I think catch-up potential is even larger in those countries than, say, in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, that are already fairly advanced. So that you could say that there's even more uh, potential there. Uh, but in terms of yeah, political issues, political stability, uh, general uh, competitiveness, uh, this is perhaps less less straightforward. So uh, I don't really have a clear clear opinion because those countries are outside of our day-to-day -day focus uh, unfortunately <laughs> uh, we're focused on the on the largest economy because we don't have such a such a large team of, of economists and, and and analysts uh but uh, yeah I mean overall I think it's even in those countries are still still attractive but they have perhaps more more challenges and, and structural issues than than other central and eastern economies I would say Okay, and and by the way, I think uh, it's fair to say that ZKB is now the second largest bank in Switzerland, right? Is that yes. true? Yes, true. Well, measured uh, by whatever, yes, but it depends <laughs> on not in terms of employees, but uh, yeah, in terms of uh, perhaps assets or yeah, or general. Yeah, revenue, yeah, yeah. So thanks to Credit Suisse UBS. Well, anyway, anyway, we have a good question here uh, from Claudio again. Um, how do you see the region positioning itself for the Ukraine reconstruction opportunities, investments, other related factors? Reconstruction in Ukraine. Yes. Do you see any opportunities or 
or investments happening in the countries. You know, the, you know, in principle, the countries get ready to as if this will happen. That you know, you know, you're ready, and they will come from Poland or, and then enter, uh, uh, you know, start helping the Ukraine out of those countries. So, meaning it's like this indirect effect that Poland is gonna profit from. Right, Claudio, I would say that's about or less the question. Yeah, well, that's difficult to say uh, right now from from geopolitical point of view. I'm actually quite quite pessimistic right now in terms of what's going on in the in the Ukraine and the Russian uh, attacks that are become, becoming more intensive, and also Ukrainian armed forces lacking uh, supplies and, and ammunition. So I think it's a bit premature to talk about uh, reconstruction already. I hope it will start soon, but right now I think. Uh, We've become a bit more more cautious and perhaps a bit more more pessimistic. But yeah, of course, firms have to already make those those considerations uh, right now. There will be potential, yeah, once once this gets going. Uh, but I think this is already, uh, yeah, still unfortunately quite a, quite a long time away before we can talk about uh, actual help and, and reconstruction in, in the Ukraine. But once it starts, yeah, of course, it will be. Uh, a huge opportunity because we know there will be billions and billions of of investments that are that are necessary to build that uh, country back up. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, are there any other question? I have always questions, but I think we also have almost reach our lunch time, twelve o'clock. So that. So um, I would like to conclude this uh, webinar. Martin, this has been tremendously interesting. Thanks a lot for this great preparation and also uh, your focus on Central Eastern Europe. Again, I, as he was mentioning, I guess the, the focus on Central Eastern Europe from a Zuckerberg point of view has a small, let's say probably research team that maybe bigger, the biggest bank have. Uh, it's, it's not normal that you have so many uh, numbers that you dug out for us. And so this is highly, uh, appreciated. It was also very interesting. And uh, so our next session, I just wanted to mention that again, will be about artificial intelligence once again in, in the medtech sector at the beginning of May. And uh, well, that's it. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, and uh, so I wish everybody uh, uh, have a good lunch and uh, talk to you soon. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.